say good morning everyone and welcome to the morning service on this beautiful sunny Sunday morning. Good morning Rachel. And welcome to today who's um, come to speak to us so we look forward to what the Lord's got to say through, through him when he shares God's word with us later. The theme of our service this morning is repentance and forgiveness. And I was hoping that as we assembled, that as you um, saw the um, the painting of Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son, that um, it helped me turn your thoughts to the welcome, mercy and forgiveness of God. In our readings later, we hear of Jesus telling his disciples on Easter Sunday evening what the scriptures said about him, that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. And then sometime after the ascension, Peter urged the people to repent and turn to God so that times of refreshing might come from the Lord. So we begin our service. And as usual, please join in the words in Yemen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Have our first song now, and um, as Carolyn plays, um, you can hum along or make melody in your hearts to the Lord. Let's worship the Lord in this beautiful song. the Lord of my soul, oh my 
come now to our time of confession. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses. Though we have rebelled against him, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws which he set before us. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us humble ourselves before the Lord in recognition of our continual need to repent of our sins and for the sins of the nation, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and save us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes, as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins. Open our eyes to God's truth. Strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the collect for the third Sunday of Easter, Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us, that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The next song is called Living Hope. Um, and we're going to listen to a, a YouTube clip. Um, so let us bless the Lord um, that He's our living hope. He's the one who set us free.
The first fruit is given from Acts chapter 3, verse 12 to 19. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one, and ask that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes to him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is so God fulfilled what he had foretold to all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from Luke 24, reading from verse 36. While they were still talking, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled, and why do you doubt, and why do you doubt rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see me now. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could see and understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name in all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of the Lord. Nice. It's really good to be here again. Ooh. I'm just going to get my notes. It's always helpful. Let us pray. Father, speak to us this morning. Lord, may we know your presence around us. Lord, may these words speak to us, encourage us, and challenge us. Help us to hear your voice this morning. Amen. 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 Now imagine that you are one of Jesus' disciples. A few days ago, you saw Jesus. The man you thought was the Son of God, your teacher, your friend, 
and you knew him intimately, and you'd travelled with him for the last few years. You'd seen him do things that you couldn't begin to explain and even sometimes understand. But you believed that God was working through him and that he might have even been God come to earth. But those few days ago, you saw him mocked, you saw him tortured, and you saw him killed. It was in a public way and all saw and people cried out to him and mocked him as he was on that cross. And then you saw him die. And so you were afraid and you hid and you hid with your other followers, those who followed you for those last three years or those who followed you in the last six months or those who even missed family. You didn't know what to do. You were scared, you were afraid, you were worried. So you stayed in the room. But then a couple of days later, on the Sunday, some of the women said that Jesus had come back to life, that he had appeared to them when they went and visited the tomb. But Peter, the leader of your group, went to where Jesus was buried. But he didn't find Jesus. He only found the bandages or the grave clothes that Jesus was wrapped in. There was no Jesus, alive or dead. You weren't quite sure what to think. Then, two of your group were going for a walk and they'd met a stranger. And as they were getting to the end of the walk and as they shared a meal, they realised that this stranger was Jesus. That they said he'd come back, he was alive. But he wasn't here yet. But why had he only shown himself to those women and those two other disciples? And you're there discussing it with everyone. And then suddenly in the room where you're chatting, Jesus is there. You're not quite sure how, but he's there. He's among all of you. And you think, is, is this really him? Is this... Are you imagining what you're seeing? Is this a ghost? Is he some sort of angelic presence? Or is it him? But then he shows you the holes which the nails made. Yeah, they're still there. There's some pretty grisly scars. But could it still be a ghost? Everyone else looks pretty shocked. And then he asks for some food. And he sits there amongst you, eating it. And I, I wanted to put ourselves in one of the disciples' per position, to try and emphasise where they might have been coming from, what's been going on in their heads. And it appears there was, they were confused. That around the disciples' reactions, they weren't quite sure that Jesus was back. Maybe they didn't want to hope. Maybe they'd been hurt too much, they didn't want to give that hope to think, yes, he really is back. Or maybe they doubted. And that immediately before this passage in Luke, it was the road to Emmaus, where Jesus appeared to two unnamed followers. We think they might be either disciples or close followers of Jesus. But before that, Jesus had only appeared to the woman at the tomb. The disciples and the other followers of Jesus seem unsure. But then suddenly he appears amongst them. And when Jesus appears, he seems, seems, seems to want to emphasise that he was fully alive, that he wasn't a ghost. Why else would he show them the wounds in his hands, in his feet, and on his side? He asked them to touch them, to show that he's real, he's not that if they were to put this hand, they're not going to go through him like we might see on a ghost in a movie. But then he asks for some food. What ghost can eat food? But also, angels in the Old Testament were known sometimes for not being able to eat food. So he's saying that I am here, I'm back, I'm not a ghost, I'm not some angelic presence, I am here, alive, back, amongst you. 
Jesus has to prove to his unbelieving disciples that he'd risen. That they'd seen Jesus do so much, but still some of them didn't believe. Now, was Jesus angry with them? No, he doesn't seem to be angry, but he explained to them what had to happen to him. Now, in verse 45, it says that Jesus opens their minds. And this wasn't a magic spell that suddenly they could just realise, but it was a paraphrase that it was used to say that basically Jesus then explained to them why, what, and how. He explained to them what has happened, how this had come to be. And then we have after that a quote which runs from verse 46 to 49. That in the Church of England le lectionary, and what we heard this morning, that it ends at verse 48. That we don't hear verse 49 today. And so, but in this quote, Jesus explains all that he did that, so that sins will be forgiven, and that Jesus needed to be preached to all of the nations and all of those who believe in Jesus, who turn from their old ways and trust him, will know eternal life and for forgiveness for their sins. However, as I said, the lectionary cuts off first for 49. And I understand why, because it points too far ahead in the church calendar. But actually, I think it's crucial to understanding a little bit about this passage. Verse 49 reads, I'm going to send you to what my Father has promised. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Now, Jesus is promising the Holy Spirit. He's pointing to Pentecost. That's why the Church of England don't want us to get that far ahead yet. They want us to stay in Easter. But actually, Jesus here is saying, look to Pentecost already. But it's, this is really helpful to help us to understand this passage. That Jesus is saying to those scared disciples and followers of Jesus who are unsure that even come back to life. He's saying, now you must go and you must preach this my news. You must say these things in my name. Then you must say them to the whole world. And you've got to do miracles through my name. But how are you going to do that? through the Holy Spirit. It's not through your strength, but through God's. And we're gonna have a look at the Acts passage, which Gloria read, but first I wanted to stop and to pause briefly. The disciples, Jesus' closest followers, the ones who traveled with Jesus throughout his ministry, it appears that they didn't believe that Jesus had risen. The thought that Jesus had to prove the fact that he wasn't a ghost it shows that. So I want to say that sometimes if you found yourself doubting or unsure or wondering where God is in this, remember that's okay at times. That Jesus' disciples did. But the disciples also had their eyes opened. They spent time with Jesus, that learning from him and they heard his explanation of how and why what happened. So sometimes maybe when we're doubting, we need to think actually, do we need to spend more time in the scriptures encountering Jesus that when our doubts come? Or, or spending time with others, although that's harder now, whether virtually or physically or in gardens, hearing the truths of Jesus once again. But also maybe we need to ask to put our God glasses on them. But ask for our eyes to be opened to Jesus once again, so we're able to trust God. But maybe we need to ask for forgiveness and turn again to God. But then we move on to our Acts story, which Gloria read, and then we hear that a crowd are pressed around Peter and John, amazed at what had just happened. What did just happen? But what had just happened was that Peter and John were on their way to the temple and they just saw a man who was unable to walk begging. And instead of giving him money, they said, in Jesus' name be healed, and this man was healed. And now this man was known to all in the temple 
and he started running around. And immediately, people were going, wow, this man has been healed. And they run to Peter and John and press around him, wondering, how did they do this? Can I have some of this healing power? How? I want to know. And so Peter starts by telling off the crowd. The crowd who had seen Jesus perform miracle after miracle. But also the crowd who handed Jesus over to be executed. And that Peter is actually quite critical of them. He says, why do you stare at us? But if our own power of godliness we made, made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one, asking that a murder be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Well, Peter does not hold back. He, he lays the blame at that crowd's feet. You can imagine the silence of the crowd. It turns from excitedness, oh, I want to know how to do this, to, oh, wow. But then Peter goes on. And he explains that by faith in Jesus and through the power of Jesus' name, this man was healed. But also, if anyone comes to Jesus, they will be forgiven. They needed to turn from their life that they have and to come to Jesus. And that Peter does go on and say that those who condemned Jesus acted in ignorance. And the leaders were ignorant. They didn't know what they were doing. Jesus had to be crucified so that he could raise from the dead to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. So he softens, but he does call them to turn to Jesus. He says, repent and turn to God. <coughs> now, repentance. Repentance is often described as, or meaning as, to turn back to God. So why does Peter say, repent and turn? Surely that's Peter going, turn, turn back to God. That doesn't make very much sense to turn, turn. Well, yes and no. And so repentance and turn, the way that you used here, are two different words in Greek. They're different. One is the turning of the mind, and one is the turning of one's life. So, so Peter is saying that you don't just need to turn your mind to God, you need to turn the way that you live your life. But also you don't just want to turn the way you live your life, you need to turn your mind and that's your heart. So Peter is saying you need all of you, it has to be all of us, it needs to come and turn to God. You can't just mentally agree, your whole life has to that Peter is saying you can't separate our parts of life from God. You can't say, well, this bit of my life is for God, but actually this bit, I just want to keep to myself. It's the saying, uh, yes, all I am is yours, Jesus. I am for you. All of me is yours. So maybe today, we need to do that again. Or for the first time. Or maybe today that we have people on our hearts that we want to pray that they will do that in their lives. So maybe today we want to say, God, help me to trust in your promises. Now open my eyes to see you again. Or maybe we're praying that for someone we know and we love. Do we need to hear that message of love again? Do we need to come before Jesus once again and say, I am yours, my life is yours. I turn away from the life that the world wants me to live and now I want to follow you. Or do we feel tired and exhausted today? And do we say, Jesus, I can't 
Do this once and keep going. Help me to rely on you and your strength and not do it through my own. Or maybe we just want to dwell in Jesus' presence once again. So knowing that we are loved, that we are forgiven, let us come again to Jesus once again, asking for forgiveness, but asking to know that we are in God's presence. So let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, we ask once again for forgiveness. Where we have done things which has not loved our neighbour as ourself, or have hurt you, or we have knowingly turned away from you, Lord, we pray for forgiveness. But Father, we thank you for your love for us, that you died and you came back to life to take away those sins so that we can know you once again, that we can dwell in your presence. Lord, remind us of that today. But Lord, we lift to you those who we desperately want to see you. For those who we wish to know, they would know you once again. Lord, help us to know, to know your presence and to know your love. Amen. I'm saying we'll come and lead us in our prayers. Sorry, my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Let us stand and say the creed together. I believe in God, Father of all minds, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of the body and the life of the Amen. Just skip these links and I'll dangle them in a prayer. Thank you. Okay, let us pray. We thank you for taking us safely through the past week and for the lovely weather we had yesterday and for today. Dear Lord, we ask you for you to give strength, peace and restoration to all those who are bereaved and grieving. We ask you to bless, strengthen and comfort the Queen and the rest of the family who are grieving for Prince Philip. Worldwide, we ask you to comfort and strengthen people who are grieving from losing someone, not just in this country, but nationwide. We ask for healing in America, where there has been so much pain recently in Minnesota, Indianapolis, and now Chicago. We give thanks for the neighboring islands around the Caribbean, who have been supporting St. Vincent and the Grenadines, during this difficult time of the eruption of the volcanic ash. Over hundreds of people have been left homeless, but thank God no one has died. We just pray that contributions continue to flow and support the island. We pray as teachers and children return back to school this week. We ask for safety and a happy learning environment for everyone to have. 
We pray that the new vicar will be appointed soon for St. Gabriel's and hope that there will be an announcement soon. We pray for all those who are sick, whether they are at home or in hospital, not just those attending St. Gabriel's, but throughout the parish and the whole country. We pray, we pray for the continuation of the vaccine to be effective and that more people will continue to take it. We will now conclude by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Um, we'll now have our closing prayers because as it's such a lovely day, um, we will go outside to sing our, our final song. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We will not offer to God offerings oh, that cost us nothing. Go in peace and serve the Lord. We will seek peace and help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. You are called and loved by God the Father, and kept safe by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance. From God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. We say together, God of power, may the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gifts of your spirit equip us to serve and worship you now and always. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. Be blessed. And let's go and to sing our final song. <laughs>